Shalom, everyone. Let's do some news. First up here, economic news. This is a story from Breitbart. The Assistant Secretary of Public Affairs at the U.S. Treasury, Monica Crowley, is talking about economic growth in the United States. They talk about job numbers, etc. This past week, they announced unemployment had fallen to 3.5%, which is the lowest number since 1969. November job surge of 266,000 jobs last month. Uh, I'm interested to know how many of those were private sector jobs, how many were public sector jobs. Um, as you may or may not know, <clears throat> a public sector job or a government job is not a win for the economy. Uh, that salary is coming out of your paycheck. Your wages are being taxed to expand the federal government, to expand the state government, to expand the local government, to create jobs. Jobs are only created by free markets voluntarily. So private sector versus public sector jobs are especially important to discern between. She talks about um, the economic freedom uh, being promoted under this president. Uh, maybe, maybe not. A uh, record number of people working. Basically, so that that unemployment number is pretty incredible. Um, I heard Tim Pool talking about a MSNBC host, Jim Cramer. He's 64, 65 years old, something like that. These are the best unemployment numbers he's seen in his lifetime. And despite being an, on MSNBC, he's giving credit where credit is due. Uh, the president's deregulation of industry. I believe uh, there's somewhere around 22 or 23 regulations eliminated for every new regulation passed. And that, that kind of economic freedom allows employers to expand, allows them to hire, uh, allows them to move into places they might not otherwise be able to move. So since uh, the 2016 election, when we were all told the economy was going to crash, we were going to enter a depression, we were going to war with North Korea, we were going to war with Russia, we were going to war with Syria, we were going to be in war everywhere forever and poor as a result of electing Donald Trump. Uh, here in Trump's America, it seems like it's, it's a pretty good environment for people who want to work. So if you want to work, you can work. Um, since the president's election in November 2016, the economy has added more than 7 million jobs. This is more than the entire population of Massachusetts last year. It's also 5.1 million more jobs than the Congressional Budget Office projected in its final forecast before the 2016 election. So the Congressional Budget Office had a slightly different picture than the media was portraying with regard to the, the jobs and with regard to the economy following the election knowing that it was a change election, we were going from uh, Hussein Obama to a conservative president, conservative president, I don't, I don't happen to think that Donald Trump is conservative. Um, a realistic expectation is that there will be jobs growth. When you, when you steer away from socialist or communist style policies, you get growth in the free market. If you add deregulation on top of that, you get increased growth and rapidly. So big time jobs numbers um, and better prospects for workers. If you are a wage earner and you are dissatisfied with your current occupation, there has never been a better time for you to polish up your resume and start putting it out there. Uh, don't put your job at risk, obviously, by letting your employer know that you're actively seeking other accommodations, but now would be a good time. It's a buyer's market, right? There, there are more jobs than there are people to fill those jobs, and unless we start massively importing third world labor, you should see wages rise in response to this as employers try to entice talent into their organizations. So the price of labor will have to rise to meet what is necessary for John Q. Public, who is a tax collector, to leave his job and go and work for a new firm. Okay, we want you. We have a shortage in this department. You have skills X, Y, Z. We're willing to pay more than anyone else to get you here. So 
a labor shortage with an overabundance of jobs should lead to wage increases. Now, there are a number of ways the government can fuck that up, and hopefully uh, they're not going to do that. You start, you start paring down immigration so that there is not an influx of cheap labor into the United States, and you should even see skillless labor, fry cooks and the like, they should see their wages increase. And if not, polish that resume. Maybe Hardee's will pay you more than McDonald's does. Crowley continues. He's running in 2016. It was an America First platform. Um, debatable whether he has been America First at this time. Like right now, there's a national conversation about uh, cooperation with Ukraine and dangling foreign aid in exchange for an investigation. But no one's really asking why we're giving aid to Ukraine. No one's really asking why we are pumping U.S. tax dollars outside the country when we have an abundance of problems here. Maybe the job market isn't one right now, but <clears throat> mental health crisis, obesity crisis, uh, homelessness, uh, people can't afford medicine, people can't afford housing, people can't afford a number of things, despite the economy booming, so to speak. So there's, there's something that's preventing people from taking advantage of this. Now, whether that's related to perception and surely the media has something to do with that, saying that, well, <clears throat> you're a victim, right? You're th the, it's external factors that led you to where you are, and there's nothing you can do about it. Okay, a more optimistic view would be that, well, maybe there are some problems with me. Maybe I can increase my level of awareness of those problems and start to mitigate my faults while enhancing my strengths as opposed to dislocating the source of my suffering. If my suffering originates within myself, there's something I can do about it, right? If my suffering is the result of my wife, all I can do is avoid my wife. All I can do is throw her out. I can't do anything to fix the problem and, and maintain the status quo, so to speak, to, to such extent that we should try and maintain it. So this... This economic freedom agenda, this is another buzzword, uh, tax cuts. Those tax cuts, despite what the media is telling you, did reduce your taxes. So you can compare your returns from two years ago, a year ago, to your most recent tax return, and you are, you are keeping more of your earnings, right? Uh, I don't, it's difficult to argue when you put it in easy-to-understand terms against a tax cut right, particularly if that tax cut is across the board, which it is. Of course, someone who is paying a million dollars in taxes is going to get more back on their, on their tax return than someone who's making $10,000. So depending on how I frame it, I can make you think like you're getting uh, the short end of the stick, so to speak, but it has to do with percentages. It's a proportion game. We don't think well in proportions. All right. Mayor Pete... Uh, the homosexual Indiana governor running for president uh, is turning to God to win over black supporters. So my high school was somewhere between 85 and 90 percent black. Um, my grade schools were likely even higher. Um, I didn't have a white friend who was not a family member until first grade, I think. Uh, so I, I grew up around black people. I, I wouldn't say that I, I'm a voice of black people or that I know black people, but black people aren't buying this. Uh, no matter what this pastor has to say, look at this fucking guy. No matter what this pastor has to say, look at the way this woman is looking at him, Right. She can't believe what this motherfucker's saying, right? Or that he's standing next to this guy who sucks dick. They're not going to buy it. And, and I believe, if I'm not mistaken, I'm not a, a theologian, uh, there are some unfriendly things about 
homosexual and other deviant sexual behavior in the Bible. And uh, I, I would assume this pastor knows that. Um, so that's why his head is down. He, he looks ashamed of what he's doing. This, this woman who's looking at him in the picture can tell that, like, what are you doing? What are you doing? So you, you are of a faith. You are a representative of a faith that is based on an objective moral code that's outlined in a book that's really old, right? And your job is to preach in a matter consistent with the teachings of that book. And you are standing here with someone whose lifestyle is in direct conflict with your ideology. So either the people within your church are going to distance themselves from you, or you are going to distance yourself from the people in that church. I suppose there's a third lane here where everyone just gets further away from Christian doctrine. And perhaps that's the case. Perhaps this is an atheist church and they don't care what uh, what the Bible has to say about this. So it's it's about clicks. It's about headlines. It's about exactly what I'm doing here. I'm I'm talking about a Daily Beast story because they're saying something so ridiculous that people won't believe it and they'll click on it to read it maybe or they'll just buy the headline win over black supporters why, why not just appeal to American citizens on the topic of homosexuality breakthrough or threat research on genetics of same-sex behavior ignites ethical debates so what they're talking about here is looking for uh, genomic evidence for um, a predisposition to homosexuality so the argument non-argument really about whether homosexuality is a choice or if it's um, the result of the ingredients in you is I, I thought settled uh, as as far back as the mid 90s when this kind of research began but they, they developed some application that was doing an analysis of these 500,000 DNA samples, and they believe they've identified five locations in the genome that are associated with same-sex sexual behavior. Now, there are going to have to be controls to see if these, these five indicators are present in straight people, and then they're going to have to ask, well, are you really straight or are you really gay? And it, it ignites um, a controversy, you could call it. Who knows? But... It, it should settle at least from the, the analytic perspective, not the emotional perspective, whether homosexuality is a choice or if it's genetic. If you are, if you are born gay or if you decide to be gay or if you end up uh, confused and feeling as if you might be homosexual as a, as a result of childhood abuse or, or something of the like, you, you've imprinted um, on that sexual experience and associated with with uh, with your own sexuality that that victimization becomes associated with your own sexuality so this this could settle that and say well obviously you cannot discriminate against someone who is a certain way through no fault no fault of their own not not that it would be a fault I, that's a, a poor way to phrase that but their disposition is involuntary right they're, they're just gay they're just tall they're just white they're just black they're whatever this this is something you have no no control over George Carlin makes a joke about uh, the preposterous notion that one would be proud of one's race or proud of one's uh, heritage let's say so you're let's say uh, black pride or Irish pride uh, you didn't do anything right you were ju you just happened to fall out of an Irish vagina, and you're proud of that. You're you're proud of the legacy that that endowed you with. It's an absurd notion, but you you wouldn't be able to discriminate against someone for something that's beyond their control. So if this can be settled scientifically, um, of course, uh, perhaps perhaps it even runs into direct conflict with religious exemption. So perhaps in spite of your religious objection to homosexuality, 
you wouldn't be able to discriminate against two people who want to have a gay wedding and want you to bake their cake so they can make a big deal about it and get it on national news to call you a bigot. You, you wouldn't be able to because they, you're, you're running into um, personal freedom and religious freedom. So there is, a, there is a debate to be had there. There is some friction there. So this app was called How Gay Are You? Um, and it was called out as a gross and dangerous mi mischaracterization of the work to call this a, uh, you can think of it like a doxing app, I suppose. Okay, if you can get a hold of someone's genetic information and you can run it through this program, you could start outing people you suspect might be gay as a result of their genome, right? You have these five markers, I'm pretty sure you're gay, and plus science says you're gay maybe you start seeing discrimination on um, on the level of genetics and well there's there's some conversation to be had about what what we should do or not do about that all right New Zealand there was a volcano eruption while people are in the volcano touring it <sighs> two people are missing five confirmed dead uh, they don't expect survivors, obviously, because these people were inside a volcano. This is the kind of thing that only kills white people, right? You're, you're not going to find um, a Hispanic guy in a volcano. You're not going to find a black guy in a volcano. You will find five tourists from Britain in a volcano just to do it right uh, this is sad it's sad for their families um, it's also sad that people go into volcanoes um, I, I hope these people don't have children um, and I guess apparently there were live streams you can probably find video of this I don't suspect uh, you're gonna see anything terribly violent but you will have in the back of your mind that these people die and perhaps that affects your your spirit in some way all right, so there was a Art Basel, Miami. Somebody duct taped a banana to the wall, called it art, sold for $120,000 because people are retarded. What happens? A uh, guy goes in there, says, well, anyone can do anything, right? It's art. Takes the banana down, eats it. Uh, people think it's part of an exhibition. Then another guy comes in with um, lipstick and writes, Epstein didn't kill himself. Uh, in red lipstick where this banana was once taped. You can find video of this. Uh, it sort of looks like the spirit cooking type writing. Maybe that's what they were going for. Uh, maybe this is just a stunt to draw attention to the Art Basel so these, these people can peddle their artwork. Who knows? Um, but this guy is a hero, right? Well done. Global Inequality Gap. Um, Steven Pinker just wrote a book um, about our, our perception of how bad things are and what the world is like objectively compared with 50 years ago, compared with 100 years ago. Um, global Inequality and Living Conditions, first chart they have here. Um, between the world's worst off and best off countries. So they're measuring mortality rate of children under the age of five, life expectancy at birth, mean years of schooling, expected years of schooling, and average income. So with regard to the mortality rate of children under the age of five, if you think about the turn of the century, let's say um, eight, 1800, right? Uh, infant mortality is going to be very high. Uh, child mortality before the age of five is going to be very high. What they're saying is about 43%, but that data is uh, sort of an estimate, right? So I wouldn't put too much stock in those figures across the bottom. The global average is in 1800. But the mortality rate in Somalia, which is the worst off country uh, in the world as far as mortality rate for children, 12.7%. Uh, and I suspect that is declining rapidly. Uh, as are all of these indicators for the better. Uh, Iceland has less than a 1% uh, 
mortality rate for the children under five. Life expectancy at birth, topping the charts here, 84.1 years in Japan. The global average is 72. And the average life expectancy in Sierra Leone is 52 years. So you don't have much time if you're living in Sierra Leone. I suspect that's why there's not a lot of uh, immigration from America, Britain, uh, Australia to Sierra Leone and why immigration is one way. Mean years of schooling received by people older than 24 for 2017 data 14.1 years in school in Germany uh, on average. Global average about 8.4 years and Burkina Faso is really killing it at 1.5 years of schooling. So perhaps we can make a dent in the inequity um, that we perceive between Burkina, Burkina Faso and Germany by uh, promoting education there. I don't know how you promote education there uh, voluntarily because it, the way we seem to solve problems uh, or what we perceive as problems typically involves pointing a gun at someone to pay for something for another person. So how we can go about doing that voluntarily, I don't know. Um, nutrition, uh, a safe childhood environment, and exposure to the widest diversity of words possible seem to be the three primary ways we can really boost IQ and G, general intelligence. Uh, so if we can do that for Burkina Faso in a way that doesn't involve pointing a gun at me or John Q. Taxpayer, uh, I think is a good thing. Expected years of schooling. So mean years versus expected years. 22.9 years in Australia, the global average. Expected years of schools, 12.7. In the U.S., 12 roughly, unless you drop out or you go to college. Um, and 4.9 years in South Sudan. It does not look like Africa is doing very well uh, as far as global standards. Average income, Qatar, or Qatar, depending on how you say it. GDP per capita adjusted for price differences between countries. This is 2017 data again. Qatar, average income per person, $116,936. Average, uh, somewhere around 55000 Oh, I'm sorry, the global average, 15469 So this one's going to be skewed big time uh, because of this reason here. The Central African Republic, $661. And that's going to be annually? Doesn't say. I'm looking at this U.S. number, 54000 That looks like an, an annual average, given that some people are making millions and some people are making nothing. Uh, 54000 seems reasonable, so I'm guessing that's $661 per year in the Central African Republic. So that's not good. That's not where you want to be. Uh, any, anywhere in Africa does not look like a place you want to be, it seems. All right, there's another chart down here, life expectancy in 1800. Again, these are these are probably worthless estimates. They're, they're based on some, uh, some knowledge of the time, but it's, it's very difficult to make predictions like this for, say, 1800 without accurate data to rely on. Uh, they look at mean years of schooling, um, highest and lowest, Germany and Burkina Faso, as I mentioned, uh, versus expected years, Australia versus South Sudan. Uh, South Sudan, Burkina Faso not doing too well. Germany and Australia doing very well. GDP per capita. Uh, this is another visualization of the information I gave you a moment ago. Uh, and this source is the Madison Project Database 2018. So again, they were using 2017 data for this. Uh, you can look at it in chart form, map. Uh, you can see the data and sources for this. Research shows that investing in education can greatly narrow the inequality gap. Just one additional year of school can raise a person's income by 10%, raise average annual GDP growth by 0.37%, reduce the probability of motherhood by 7.3%, reduce the likelihood of child marriage by greater than 5 percentage points. Okay, so yes, we want less child marriage. Uh, do we want to reduce the probability of motherhood? 
by 7.3 percent I don't think so so if you if you use just that data point and contrast it with uh, a question let's say should we invest in education should we give everyone an additional year of education given that we are reducing the probability of motherhood by 7.3 percent not in the first world we shouldn't um, perhaps in the third world where population growth is running away and the dumbest people are having more babies than ever before uh, you're getting a a parabolic growth chart in population in the poorest and least intelligent countries in the in the world uh, many of those in Africa we just did the rundown for Burkina Faso uh, Somalia and South Sudan those are not places where you want people maximizing the productivity in terms of children for women of childbearing age perhaps increasing the education in those areas voluntarily again uh, can reduce that population growth in the West uh, the United States um, we need population growth right so I just talked about those job numbers a minute ago there are, there are seven million jobs available un unclaimed jobs right uh, three point five percent of the country is unemployed let's see if we can steer those people into those jobs and it's not likely we'll be able to let's say ten percent of Americans uh, have an IQ below seventy they're essentially unemployable even even in the in the 80 range depending on your disposition if you're very friendly or you have some unique skill perhaps you're employable but on the low end of the IQ distribution we're gonna have a difficult time caring for these people as we become increasingly sophisticated as a society how we're going to care for those people and how we're going to do it in a voluntary way is beyond me um, the second thing they say here we're going to raise a person's income by up to 10 percent okay that's that's optimistic right a year of school raising your income by 10 percent um, I did it actually um, I think I've beaten that 10 percent but again we're ignoring IQ we're ignoring individual capacity I if I if I give a person who is functionally retarded a year of schooling I'm not going to increase their income by 10 percent unless when I say schooling I'm not just talking about uh, a classroom education in history and math and science and writing right if by education you mean I'm going to teach this person how to operate a cash register I'm going to teach this person how to use a t-square and do carpentry I'm going to teach this person basic electrical theory I'm going to teach this person something useful something that will help them obtain a job become a professional etc Bec become a part of the contributing class in the United States where you are you are a net payer of taxes rather than a net recipient if that's the kind of education you're talking about I agree that you can raise a person's income by that amount but as you will see over the next 10 years people who are getting bachelor's degrees that are meaningless people are getting bachelor's degrees that don't directly translate to employment are not going to be doing well what we're looking at when we talk about um, a college degree increasing your income across time we're thinking of people in the 1950s and 1960s when only about 10 percent of the country went to higher education after high school or or maybe even a marginal percentage graduated high school so if you were to control the results of that inquiry by IQ what you're going to see is that extra year of school is going to yes help those who are highest in IQ increase their earnings but all you're doing for people who are low in competence is wasting another year where they they get to just hang out at a college and get C's okay the piece of paper you're getting is the same of the same as the piece of paper that I am getting but we are going to be differently able at putting that to use right 
So that's that's something to think about when we talk about well, a college degree is going to increase your income. Okay, it will, maybe right now, but over the next ten years, when there is a glut of students with bachelor's degrees and no skills, you're going to see employers start using a degree as a way to screen out applicants and say, well, we're going to revert to a model that worked prior to government subsidization of student loans and we're going to start hiring people in the mailroom and we are going to gradually increase their level of competence horizontally and vertically expand their area of responsibility and we're going to train good employees as opposed to trying to hire them from a pool of people who have spent 20 years being indoctrinated to believe that capitalism is evil. Red flag laws. First gun owner charged under Florida red flag law found guilty after refusal to give up weapons, including AR-15 rifles. So this is from The Sun. They use a bunch of uh, inflammatory words to describe firearms. Jaron Smith or Jaron Smith uh, refused to give up his arsenal of weapons. I think he had a rifle and a pistol. Uh, yeah, there is. So he, he's got an AR. Uh, it's a favorite of mass shooters. Okay, so this guy, allegedly, I don't know, I'll, I have no reason to doubt it, fired his weapon at a car being driven by someone in March of last year. So he is being tried for attempted murder, and they want to confiscate his firearms as a result of him firing his weapon in a residential neighborhood at a moving car. Um, this is a tough one, right? So... Do you allow the authorities to seize the weapons from this guy, even though he has not been convicted of a crime? He is alleged to have committed a crime. Um, I, so this case only, my intuition is to say, if there are witnesses that state that this guy did this, there's going to be gunpowder on his hand, there's going to be a spent shell casing, and there's going to be an impact site somewhere for that round. If this guy fired his weapon at a moving car, you should execute him, right? So you try him and execute him. The problem is we have so much bullshit going on in the judicial system that things that should be, okay, this is, this is open and shut, get pushed back in the ledger, pushed back in the ledger, pushed back in the ledger. It's the same thing you see in healthcare, where people are showing up in the emergency room with no insurance when they have the flu or they have a cold, right? And people with broken collarbones or appendicitis are waiting hours for care because the emergency room is overloaded with people who should not be at the emergency room. Same thing in the judicial system. We, it's bloated. Like, like all bureaucratic institutions, it's bloated. So that's all I got for you guys today. Uh, we will see you.